all, thank you. Thank you for the lovely invitation. So I just, when I received the email to come here, I said, well, that would be my chance to finally visit uh, the Woolworths area, which I will do this weekend. So hopefully the weather will be nice with me. Uh, let's talk about the exoplanet and revolution. So it's pretty interesting to think about backwards. Most of the people in the audience, uh, some of you are not even born at that moment. When uh, more than 30 years ago, uh, we completely changed the perspective by saying, hey, if you look at other stars, there are also plenty of planets orbiting these stars. Um, at the beginning, this was not completely understood. I think how far-reaching was this discoveries. And what I would like to explain to you is essentially what has happened uh, um, um, in, from this early discovery until now, and, and so much new avenues that it has, uh, um, has developed since then, and especially one of them which is related to the origin of life. So it kind of living a kind of a pivotal moment, I think, in humankind. We will remember this end of the century is the beginning of the new century as a moment when we start looking a bit outwards for the question of life in the universe. And in terms of philosophical question, there is something you can think about it as a physicist. You have one hand, you have the uh, material science that you get, I mean, chemistry, physics, anything which is material. On the other hand, you have life science. But at some point, there must be a bridge between the two because you must start for something which is not alive and become something alive. And this transition from one part of the physical world to another part of the physical world, because life science is part of the physical world, is not understood at all. And it's essentially the kind of new topic that I will be talking about. So let's go back to planet. So why do we care about planet? Why planet 30 years ago was interesting as a topic? Well, essentially, when you think about the universe, what you do see, and the bionic matter you do see easily with the telescope, is the one that is shining, that comes from the star, right? When you think about the star, there has been a, a lengthy progress to understand, I mean, how a star works, and how you make a star, and, and there's a series of events that start from something massive, which is using the material, which starts at the beginning of the universe, which is hydrogen, essentially, into a compact object that's becoming a star. Um, but at that moment, when you build the, the stellar components through this process and that kind of a big scale um, um, jump going for a factor of one more, one million in terms of scale, you also end up with something around the star, which is in a way the leftover of that process. And, and the understanding of this leftover was a, was a serious um, topic of studies from the 90s. I mean, how do you make sense into the planet? As soon as you understand the mechanic of the planet, that essentially starts with Newton, then the next question is, how do you come there? And, and, and the beginning of this idea started to emerge of mixing different scenarios, essentially trying a way to accrete the material and not into the stars, but into the planet. Well, the challenge into this, um, the whole development of the theory of this understanding is the only element you have to drive your thoughts is the solar system. So what we've done, and we've done that very well uh, in the last 50, 60 years, is sending probes, bending model to explain the solar system. And actually, this model was pretty good. This model could explain how you make the moon, how explain why you have the telluric planet inside, when you have the giant planet outside, when you have the called the fake giant planet, which are the icy giant, a bit for remote, and then predicting even other bodies that became the Kepler, um, the um, Kuiper objects, uh, much beyond, uh, I mean, um, uh, Pluto. Um, so that was really the situation here. So the idea that there are planets under the star was not something that people were challenging, really. And they get this understanding there must be, because we should not be really alone. But you have to demonstrate. It's like in physics. You come up with any theory. If you don't demonstrate, you just mean nothing. Uh, but the expectation was kind of realistic. And the big surprise is it was not exactly what we thought it was, actually. And uh, how it happened is we started to look for planet in the simplest possible way we could do that. And essentially, 30 years ago, the only technique that could barely reach a planet was by detecting the motion of a star related to an orbiting planet. If you look at Jupiter, uh, the orbit of Jupiter is creating a 10-meter high-velocity change, so change of speed, of the sun just by the fact this is shaking the sun. Uh, of course, if you look at the Earth, it's much smaller, the effect. And we say, well, okay, we can maybe do that. I mean, we use the Doppler um, techniques. We use the spectroscopy. 
we can measure this, and people have been started to think about how to assemble uh, an equipment that would make it. The challenge is, how do you make such equipment? And uh, sometimes, I mean, we've been asked, how come you made a discovery? And actually, what, the reason why it's quite common in physics when you are entering into a new, uh, a new discovery space is you have a machine which is unique that give you what we call a new window on the universe. It's also valid for particle physics or anything. You can see things in a better way than anybody else, and then you find either something that you were expecting or not exactly what you were expecting as a big surprise. So to give you a little bit of one minute about what was this machine, this is what looks like a spectrograph. Spectrograph is taking the light from a star, spreading the light uh, into the wavelength, so trying making a spectra, and then we use this, this spectroscopic information. So what was new in the 90s, there were new ways to build spectrograph, much more compact than the, that was done in the past, because in a series of components, and I just, this is LOD, and you can see it if you visit Haute Provence right now, it's on display there. There's this big piece of optic you see on the side here, and that was a brand new component at that moment. That would allow to make a compact instrument that produce extremely high resolution. So you can see the great detail um, and resolve the spectroscopy, uh, the spectral line of, of the star. The other component you do see here uh, is this kind of uh, yellowish uh, tubes that were in the 90 optical fibers. It's pretty common, optical fiber, everybody knows this. But in the 90s, most of the optical fibers were used for telecommunication at that time, and they were working in infrared, slightly in infrared. Uh, optical fibers it comes from the 70s, so it was not still, it was still there. Uh, but using them from astronomy was not really done properly, because the way you have to combine them, the way you feed the light, and astronomy, we're battling against light. Because there's so little light coming from the star, you cannot lose light. When, when you have um, an equipment and you need to communicate between two different fibers, you don't really care. You can lose 90% of the light, you still have plenty enough to communicate between two computers. So this is not okay here. And it was a complete new way to do that. With this optical fiber, we got rid of a massive problem. It's not having the equipment hanging behind the telescope. So the equipment was very stabilized, we can control everything, and making sure that when we do measure something, it's really what it is, and not just because there is a change of temperature, the telescope, or whatever. And the third equipment that was completely new, and it, you may be laughing about that, but in the 90s, there was the beginning of what we call the mini computings, which is computer between the, the very limited uh, kind of um, PC uh, that could only essentially was used for bureautic, nothing else really seriously, or the mainframe computer. Then we have to go to mainframe computer. It, was, it took a long time to get access to them, but in between, they were nothing. But in the 90s, the, the people discover this kind of beautiful machine that actually was a company built from people working for massive computer mainframe that, that took some of the component. They were a complete new kind of component, 32 bits, and created this machine. They were Sun Microsystem. Um, so we could use this machine that what I had. I, when I started my PhD, I got that machine as a gift. It was a tremendous gift. And they told me, OK, look, we need to make a machine doing this. This is a machine we need to program to make it work, essentially. So I have to define everything to, this, to, the, to develop the program, to analyze this, which was quite complicated. But at the end, we managed to build a machine and to produce uh, the, the uh, needed equipment to reach the accuracy of 10 meters per second. And that was, mash, that was magical for us, because this is exactly the amplitude you expect from Jupiter. At that moment, uh, my PhD was a success, because I, I did what I was told, essentially, to make the machine and start the program. The program would take years, obviously, because if you want to detect Jupiter, it would take at least 10 to 12 or maybe 20 years to see the slow change of the radial velocity due to the orbiting Jupiter. Well, I started the program, and after three months, I got something very bizarre. That was a variability over four days. Uh, and I say, what's it? And I think at that moment, I panicked. I thought something was wrong in the computer. Everything was broken, and my PG was a disaster, until I realized that, no, it was real. And this is the beginning of the story of discovery of 51 peg. This is how it started. Well, what happened at that moment is when we made the announcement, very few people believed into that, and there were a large skepticism into the community. And it lasted for a couple of years for good reason, because that planet had about the mass of Jupiter, but the orbit of that planet was very, very close uh, to, uh, to the star, 20 times closer than the orbit of the Earth. Doesn't make sense. Uh, in the way you understand the formation of the solar system, you can't have a giant planet so close. The reason why is because to assemble a giant planet, you need to be in the cold area of the solar system with a lot of ice. 
because you have to fight against the, the fact that the cloud is going to vanish, and then the fact you have an icy material, you're going, is, it stick together much faster, and then you can assemble a big planet way quicker that you can do uh, when you are too close to the star, when it takes much longer, and then you're left with only the solid particle, all the gas, all the stuff that you have, you have in Jupiter is gone. Uh, well, the situation actually went dramatic because the more people were detecting planets, the more they look bizarre. And right now, after 30 years, we get a completely an amazing picture of the planet we know in the universe. Every dot here is a measurement. It's a data point where we have either the mass or the size of the planet. The size of the planet works when you have a transit. So what happened is it unlikely, I mean, the transit is very unlikely because you need to be really perfectly aligned between your telescope on your eye and the star, and you have to have really the planet crossing, the orbit crossing in front of the star. Well, practically the change to do that depends on how close is the planet. The closer the planet is to the star, the more likely you get a transit. When you have a four days planet orbiting a star, the chance is 5%. So you get 20 of them, one is transiting. And actually we have quite a lot of these transiting planet. And by the fact you have the transit, you use this brief moment when you have the planet crossing the stars to compute the size of the planet. This is why we have this diagram here. Every dot is a planet. What you do see there, when you compare with the Jupiter, for example, and Earth and, and Venus, it's a quite dramatic difference here. So we have groups of planets that doesn't match really what we have in the solar system. Well, to be fair, there is also an intrinsic limitation to these discoveries is the practicality of detecting small planets. So to help to read that, we have to add some kind of boundary conditions, which is a limitation of the current technology. So anything on the right side for you cannot be detected because the signal is very unlikely for the transit or too tiny to be detected, and similarly for the radial velocity. So as of today, we cannot detect a planet like the Earth or Venus, at least at this level of orbit. But we can detect a lot of planets with the mass or the size corresponding to a planet like the mass, uh, the mass of, um, of, of Earth or, or Venus. And we do see these groups. The, the, the one on the top, on the top left, is what we call the hot Jupiter which are this massive planet, like 51 peg on short orbit, and there is quite some of them. We do have Jupiter as well, more like the old Jupiter we have in the solar system, which are sitting on the longer period. But if you look at this diagram, it's a log, it's a log scale diagram, and you will realize that a lot of them, first they have a, a period much shorter, which is clearly within the Mars orbit, and we don't have giant planets in the Mars orbit, or we have much more massive planet, five, 10 times mass Jupiter. And the question is, is it really a planet or is it something that, some, something that we call the failed stars? Because we can make a star which is not massive enough to shine, to create the thermonuclear reactions. So it's still open here, and you already see that there's a very interesting uh, debate. The gaps between the two is reflecting the formation mechanism. In the way you form Jupiter, is either you stick where you are or you move in, because the motion uh, gets pretty quick as soon as you start it. So if you never start it, you always stay where you are. But as soon as you start moving, then you right away, you get closer to the star, you dive into the star. But what came as a real surprise is the rest. The rest is right now called the mini Neptunes of the super Earth regime, which is these this groups of objects that range in a domain that nobody was expecting any planet. Essentially, all the planets which are sitting in this area here in terms of radius or mass there, they are within the orbit of Mercury. There is nothing within the orbit of Mercury. So this is where we, it was a complete surprise to find all these objects. And some of them are really mass and size corresponding to the Earth. So the challenge here is essentially how to make sense to all of this. What does it mean? How could you explain that compared to the solar system? And it's fair to say that right now we are a bit stuck because we cannot really compare uh, the situation in the solar system with the one we see in the universe. But we can reverse the argument and say, oh, but already with what we see in the universe, what can we say already just by looking at them? So you have to run statistics and to compute what's called the rate of detections or occurrence of a planet. So simply, if you look at the star, the question is, what is your chance to have any of these planets? So these numbers are difficult to get because you need to find out the threshold, the limitation of your equipment, but here they are. 
So there is very few probability chains that you will pick up of hot Jupiter, few percent. Well, the reason why we got successful is because we have more than 100 stars, and actually we had two of them in the sample, and one of them was picked up pretty quick. It was 51 peg. 10, 20% is the kind of likelihood to have a planet like Jupiter, but what was really surprising is to get this 50 to 80%. 50 or 80% of the stars that you see at night that are kind of similar to the sun, similar stage than the sun, they have a planet like that. So if you think just the opposite, it already is telling you that the solar system is not common. The solar system is possibly making the 20% left here, but it's certainly not common. So in a way, we made a big mistake at the beginning by assuming that the uh, solar system was very common and the kind of archetype and all the planet, or planet in the universe. Because it was not true, but it's a nice mistake because nature was nice with us. They gave us a gift because all these planets which are there, actually they're quite easy to detect with the technology we have. And that was a big mistake that most of the team did at that time, and it came as a surprise, because the, te the technology I'm mentioning to you, the radial velocity that detects the motions or the transit, people discard it. And there's a couple of papers at that moment that say, we should not use that because they are poorly efficient to detect the kind of planet we have in the solar system. And they're right. The only thing they missed completely is the solar system is a very special case, possibly, in the mini configuration we have. How special, how rare, we don't know, because we cannot compare. But that's the first essence learned, and that's a revolution in a way, and people tend to compare that with the Copernic Copernican revolution, but we're changing the paradigm. At that moment, people realize, oh, the Earth is orbiting the star. It's common, it's one planet amongst many. Well, we just push this element a bit further. We're just telling, well, the solar system is one amongst many, but actually it's not one we can easily compare with the other, which is an interesting question in terms of anthropomorphic perspective and the reason why we may have life. I'll come back on that. So why is it so difficult to detect a planet like the Earth? Because when you look at a star, it's not a stable machinery. The star has a structure, is a sphere, star has magnetic field, Star has region where uh, it's a bit hotter and cooler due to the magnetic field. Magnetic field is going to change the, the directions going to the stream of the electrons like they do in the sun, they direct it. And you, you create, if you do a magnetogram, you see it on the left, area with patches of the star. Uh, when you compute the change of the speed on the surface, it's the one we have a doppelgram on, in the middle. You see there's kind of a little ripples here. This is a uh, way to capture the speed, and you see kind of, kind of gap on the side, matching exactly when you have the spot of the magnetogram. It means the speed is modified, and when you measure the speed of a star or the radial velocity of a star, what you do, you just do the integral of all these different radial velocity. Particularly use the spectroscopy, so use a profile, a line profile, a spectral line profile, and a small video here give you a bit of an idea what happens when you have a spot you see the line profile is going to be changed. Because you change a little bit the structure, you hide and you change the temperature, the line profile is going to move a little bit. It's a very tiny move. It's a, mo it's a motion which is smaller than 1,000 of the width of the line profile. You don't really see it, but when you look at an effect which is exactly of that order, because line profile is typically two to 5,000 meters, and you want to look for an effect which is one meter, you don't really see it. You have to compute it in a statistical way, then it can fool you completely. And, and that situation, the intrinsic variability of the star, which is related to the nature of the surface of the star, and three-dimensional sur uh, rotating surface of, of the star, is preventing easy detection of planet. This is why we're a bit stuck right now. But the, the field is moving, and, and eventually they will detect this planet, because there is ways to do that. But it's way more difficult than we thought. But thanks God, we have all the other ones to play with. Uh, all the other ones we have, we can already do something quite interesting, is to combine the mass and the size. Because some of them, they both have a transit, and they also have a direct detections with radial velocity to get the mass. So we create this density diagram, um, with every dot and uh, with the uh, um, arrow bars are really on the, on the diagram here. And to help to read this density diagram, it's a couple of planets, there is also what we call a modeling of the structure of the planet. So we have a good idea of the model of uh, Jupiter and Saturn, which is about the same. Essentially, it's just a, a, a small core 
with a lot of hydrogen, and you can just compute the hydrogen, which is something we know very well, because all the studies being, being done uh, for the thermonuclear weapon can be reused to study exactly this pressure, the situation. And you can predict where the size of a Jupiter planet would be corresponding to a given mass. Um, you do see when you reach the tip of Neptune, you have the Neptune mass over there. It doesn't really predict very well Neptunes. So this is the reason why I was mentioning at the beginning, Neptune is called an ice giant, and it's considered as a fail giant planet. You can see that as Jupiter without the hydrogen, essentially. So they never manage to get all the hydrogen that would boost the mass from 20 to 100 times, to 1,000 times. Uh, sorry, in this case, it would be um, it's in solar mass. So it would be from, from 20 to 300 Earth mass uh, into the planet, and only kept the kind of gas, the heavy gas, and the core structure they had, and that's why they're denser. They're sitting below. This kind of blue line that is behind is just to give you an idea. If you build a planet, it's a theoretical planet made by water. Why are we making planet of water? Because water is one of the few molecules that is very well understood, thanks to the Earth scientist that needs to understand water very well, because it plays a very critical role into the motion, the internal mantle on Earth. And uh, there is a lot of studies being done on water and different pressures. So you can make a theoretical planet of water. Sometimes they're called ocean worlds. Whether they exist or not, we don't really know. But at least they would be sitting along that line. And the green line you have on the bottom is the line when you would expect a rocky planet. Well, you, you start 1-1. One, one, you see on 10 to the power zero, 0 here is 1. This is the Earth. And you can move along that line. Essentially, you take the structure of the Earth, which is an easy one because it's an average silicate structure. It doesn't have a, all this fancy uh, quantum mechanic effect you have for, for a planet like Jupiter. And what you do see from this diagram, there are clearly planets sitting in some of this uh, line, but there are also planets sitting in between. And if you can read diagram like that, you will see there is gaps or valley, and all this is being studied in great detail. And it tells something about the complexity of the real structure of a planet. So we move as well from this very simplistic picture that we may, we may have learned, and you have learned possibly in school, that we have the telluric planet, the, Essentially all the same, they're rocks, a bit of difference, of course, the denser in Mercury than in Mars, but it's just about the same. And then you have this giant planet full of hydrogen, and then you have the ice giant into a kind of a more continuum of planet with possibly planet that are different. Because most of these planets here, they are orbiting on a very short period of the star. So you have to find a mechanism to bring them there. So you have to combine this mechanism with the stage, with the early stage when you had a lot of gas you, what you had a disk at the beginning, and all this is playing together. There's an interaction between the planet and the disk, a disk of the planet. They're moving around. They're even planet colliding, some of them being ejected. So it turned out to be an extremely complex pattern at the end. So I tend to explain that, and it's even easier in this place. It's like the weather. Um, well, for a physicist, the weather, it's OK. It's a Navier-Stokes equation in a rotating framework. We can solve it, technically. True. But when you look at the detail and all the subtle effect you can have, and the, the how easy it becomes unpredictable by nature, then you can start with a kind of a given situations. But after some time, you can end up with a drastically different weather. So that's why you can predict, in average, the weather. And I can predict the, the weather today is warmer in Greece than it is in Wales. But I may be wrong, because it, there are certainly some days where it can snow in Greece, and it can be nice weather here. So this is exactly the problem we're having here. So we have a global picture of the physics that is going on. But because of the many scale, because of the complexity of the problem you have to solve, that start with a simple gravitation problem down to, at the end, mineralogy and how you glue the stuff together into vacuums and to build up the accretions, interaction, planet and the disk, you can end up with a zillions of different outcomes. And that's possibly the explanation here about the nature of the diversity of the planetary system. So in a way, this is fantastic because it becomes a playground uh, for people interested into planetology. And I used to say planetology has a revival because up to a point, there are only eight planets to play with. Uh, no, they're way more because they start studying comet and they're going to asteroids and they go to Kuiper belt and they're doing all this space of planets, way more. But still, you're limited if you want to go to planets. No, there is potentially millions and billions of planets you can study. It's just how far you're ready to go uh, to detect them. 100 billion stars in the galaxy, just if you don't remember this number. So it's just our galaxy, by the way. So you see the number you have here. So 
So that becomes an interesting background, but you also see the limitations by the approach I'm showing you. So how can we do better than that? Well, it turns out that this famous transit can be used in a much more powerful way than just to give you the radius of the star. How does it work? Well, when you have a transit, essentially you have this configuration. So there is a moment when the planet goes in front and a moment when the planet goes in, um, and behind. When the, when the planet goes behind, it's a very interesting moment because that's the only time that you don't see the planet. Well, you may be laugh about that, but if you have a very sensitive equipment and you look at your system, imagine a system of a star and a planet, uh, you never know really what you look at because the massive amount of the light that will reach a detector will come from the star. But there is a tiny bit as well that comes from the planet. Look at the moon. You can walk at night if you are in a very clear uh, situation on the mountains. I mean, people do mountaining and um, they can walk um, at the moonlight. You don't need any, any light to do that. So there is a bit of light still that comes from the planet. So it's exactly the same. So there is a reflection of the light of the planet, but also the thermal emission, depending when you look, which wavelength you look at. So behind is a kind of zero point for us, and we use this effect. So we use the system and we compare the difference between the time when the planet is behind and around, and depending when you look, you can look at the day side, night side, and you can look at this. So there is a possibility, even to, in a mixing situation, when you have a confusion, and the light comes both from the star and the planet, to say something. But then the planet is in front, and then part of the light from the star will not go through, because the light from the star will hit the planet and will not cross. So it will, we will remove a little bit of the light from the star. When you have a Jupiter-sized planet, uh, the difference um, uh, you have uh, is a factor 10. So the, the change of radius is a factor 10. So when you have the Sun and Jupiter, you will have an object which is 10 times smaller. So it will remove 1% because it's a ratio of power 2, right? When you're talking about an Earth, it's a bit more challenging because then there is still a factor 10 uh, compared to Jupiter. So it's a factor 10 to the minus 4. It's very tiny. But anything like that, I mean, give you the size of the planet, technically, if you know the, uh, the size of the star. But if you look in more detail, actually there is a bit of an atmosphere, possibly, on the, on the planet. And then what's going on when the light goes to the atmosphere? And then this is very similar to the situation when you have the sunset. We all know that the sun changed color. Well, you all know that it change doesn't change color, but you, you see the light from the sun differently because some of the light get diffracted and you don't see it. Another one is by the Rayleigh scattering. Another part goes through it. And then this one, you just see it. You see the red, you don't see the blue. That's why you have blue sky, by the way. Um, so you can use the same way here uh, of the transit. And to give you a bit of a hint uh, about what's going on, if you fly the ESS and you look at this very moment when you have the moon just behind, you see the 10 kilometer layer, what's called the biological atmosphere. The reason why we are alive right now, having this conversation, is thanks to this 10 kilometers uh, over a planet of 6,000. I do that in the visible. I observe a transit in the visible. If I do the very same measurement at the very same moment in the infrared, I will pick up the thermal irradiations from the Earth. It's what the spy satellite is doing to get rid of the atmosphere. You see there is the same picture, the same planet, but without the atmosphere. I just removed 10 kilometers. If I compute the impact of this on my detector, I will see a bit less contrast because the amount of light that will be removed from the planet will be less than before. Of course, I can push up and look at something on the top of the atmosphere, which will be the ozone, 9.6 microns. In that case, I will see a big part of the atmosphere, about 50 kilometers. So I show you that to demonstrate, um, to get the feeling that depending on the wavelength to use to detect the transit, you kind of scan through the atmosphere of the planet, and you do have the kind of event going on. So some light goes through, other don't, and essentially it corresponds to some kind of X-ray. We, we call that um, transit spectroscopy. So by measuring a transit, but not only in a white color, but in a, a lot of different wavelengths, you will see this, the planet with a different size. And you can translate this different size to different species into the atmosphere. The trick to do that is to use that machine, for example, so James Webb Space Telescope. This is the big use of that machine right now, is to observe some of this planet, that way on the diagram there, 
to pick up atmosphere of the planet. So I want to show you the very last one, which I think give you a little bit of an idea where we're heading here. So this is a Neptune-sized planet. Uh, that was observed recently and has been published recently. Every point you have here is an observation. So you see there is really ups and downs, there is trough, there is peak, and this is a change of the size of the planet depending on the wavelength, starting from one micron on the, on the blue part and to five micron here on the red part, so the infrared part. So on the top of that, when you have sort of data, you have to look to modeling and say, okay, uh, I know the size of the planet, so can I try to put in uh, an atmospheric model that will give me the best match to the data. What you do see is this blue curve, which is in a way uh, of a sample here because you wait too much information that we can detect. But what you do see here is the best model fit to the data. And the best model fit includes a series of uh, molecules that we know we would have, we could have in this planet. And, and in that case, that was a big surprise for everybody because nobody was expecting we would find methanes this way uh, carbon dioxide was expected, and there's a lot of very interesting uh, molecules that fits into the dimethyl sulfide DMS here that has been detected. That demonstrate there's a very fascinating kind of cold chemistry going on on that planet. And I was a complete surprise because on the Jupiter, on the Neptune planet, you're not supposed to see that because anything on the top is going to go down and sink on the down and get me destroy. And you come back and you don't have this on Neptune. You don't see that on Neptune. The only reason to explain that is that planet that looks like Neptune actually has a solid surface somewhere. And in between the solid surface and you, there is a kind of oceans of water that is sitting. And on the top of that, you have all these molecules that are fitting there. But just to give you an idea that this is the kind of stuff you can do. When that was shown, I was a shock because nobody thought that would be possible. And people started to extrapolate about that oceans, whether it's a liquid oceans, whether it's a super saturated oceans. I mean, we don't really know yet, but there will be more measurements on that object to find out exactly what it looks like uh, to detect the water. So they could not detect the water. There's a prediction. So they should find water now and there. And, uh, and then it leaves a completely amazing possibility. So we're talking about the planet. It turns out that the temperature of this planet it's kind of a temperate temperature as well. And there is a, about a dozen of planets similar that we can observe and will be, will be observed. And now there are even some biologists that are thinking whether you can imagine evolution of life on that planet. So I just to show you the rationale behind that. So I hope I convince you that we move to a discovery of planet, setting the scenario where we are, into a complete new regime where we are observing some of these planets are clearly different in terms of mass and size and cannot be directly compared to the solar system. So we have to live that way. So when you have this, what can we start seeing on the nature of the process going on on the surface of the planet? And this is the last jump that people have done. And they say, well, essentially what we're doing here, we're looking for the possibility of life or the, the condition for life on the planet. And then it, it, it opens a new chapter here, a complete new chapter. And I would like to just share some thoughts to explain what we're trying to do and give you an idea. And that's certainly valid for the new generation here, because I think this is going to be a true evolution for the next 20 to 50 years. Um, OK, let's go back first to the beginning. First, as an astrophysicist, I would declare I'm incompetent to talk about life, because I never learned chemistry. Uh, I'm a hardcore physicist. I learn particle physics. I learn equations. I learn black holes, uh, gravity, all that. I never learned astrophysics uh, and, and biology. So when, I st when, I, when the astrophysicists started to do that, there were really questions about what are you talking about? You don't know what you're talking about. I mean, they really talk to people um, talking about life. And then we start engaging with this community. And people realize there has been a lot of thoughts where we were meeting in the middle point. One of them is this famous quote from Christian de Duve, that is a famous biochemist. He got the Nobel Prize some time ago, where Christian de Duve wrote books about this. Uh, um, and uh, Essentially, it tried to convey this message that there is nothing special about life. There is nothing special about life. It's part of what they call the manifestation of matter. It's written into the fabric of the universe. It's a very profound statement because essentially what he's telling us, physicists, well, in the law of the physics of the universe, essentially at the very beginning, it's a very boring moment because you don't even have a star at the moment. You just have matter, hydrogen, you have the law of physics there sitting, and you have time and space and nothing. 
Well, you have the stars, and the star is magical because the star is going to process and they're going to create uh, the chemical elements. So the element, essentially, very few exist when you create the universe. Well, it's a bit magical because, well, nothing is planned anyway from the beginning, but it happens, certainly, in this universe. Well, you create the elements, but at the same time, you create the planet due to the, 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 the formation of the planetary system that comes around the stars. So by pre creating the planet, you enable a more complex chemistry to happen. Because if you don't have planet at all, if you only create elements, you will be left with cold chemistry. Uh, and that don't get very far. You do some very long alcoholic chain, but not very much at, at that point. So on the planet, it's changed completely because then you can mix the water, you can ethylene, you can mix many things, and you can do a kind of biochemistry work, whatever work you can do, and uh, create a zillions of different chemistry and components there. And on planet, life started, at least on some of them. So it seems that everything looks connected. And Christian de Duve pushed even further. He said, well, you know, everything is kind of in the law of the universe, even your brain, even your consciousness. It's enabled by the universe as well. So how do you fit that? I mean, how could you fit into the physics? So to me, I came back to the very beginning. I said, OK, fine. Uh, if we are into this universe right now, we are subject to the law of physics of the universe. So well, you should, be, you should find a way to translate that. There is a mechanism that drives one to another one. A, the matter, B, to life. Let's try to find out if we can make progress. And then we hit a big wall, which is the complexity of the biology as it has developed on Earth. So to give you a bit of feeling, if you're not familiar, especially if you're a physicist, you know nothing about that. So just to give you a bit of 101 here. Um, this is a tree of life. But the modern way to do that, I'm not sure you know that way of doing it. Because usually when you do the tree of life, you see the tree of life, but you're, you're missing the point about the time scale. As an astrophysicist, time scale is key for me. So I like the time scale. So time scale is pushed here. It's a it's kind of 2D projection here. So today is the outskirt of this diagram. Everything on the, on the top is today, right? And the more you get inside, the more you get back into the past, into the beginning of the formation of the or the, or the Earth, actually, more than 4.55 4. Um, billion years ago. If you're looking where we are in terms of species, don't look too much. We are just here over there, just on the corner here. Human over there. So, so we're part of a long series of stuff that had happened here. There is a special moment. There is explosion of life even there. I don't want to talk about that. I think it's already fascinating by itself, I think, what happened and, and to enable that. What I want to talk about is here. It's a very beginning, early birth. Right? So the challenge here, if we are sitting on the top of that big tree and we try to find out what's going on at the beginning. Nobody has found any solution to that. I mean, it's completely blurred. It's extremely complicated to find this. It's even more complicated that today, no life is created. I know you think, what is he talking about? <laughs> no, no life is created. You just replicated. I'm sorry to tell you, you're just a replication of a replication of a replication of a replication. Just look at the tree. That's it. And that's a fascinating information when you think about that. No life is being made on that planet today. At least no one, and I know a lot of colleagues in big biochemistry are obsessed by that and they're looking at that. It has never been detected. The first one to point that was Louis Pasteur. It's a famous experiment, and it demonstrates that you don't create life from nowhere. And I was still in the air in the 19th century. You can start from nowhere, and in the air you can like, no. So, how come you make life then? Essentially, if you remove life on Earth, that's it, over. Because it does, doesn't happen today. So what do you need? Well, you need to go back to the time when it happened, which is essentially four billion years ago. Life started four billion years ago on Earth. Long time ago, after half a billion years, you have evidence of life on Earth. And why it didn't happen, um, why it doesn't happen now and why it happened before is because that was how it looked like Earth at that moment. It's completely different. You don't have the same atmosphere. You don't have the same amount of material falling. You don't have the same temperature. Everything is different. So the conditions to create life needs to be that kind of stuff, at least for Earth. And the big difference is a lot of UV radiations used to beam on the surface of the planet. That was, seems to be critical to help life to start. So this is a bit of the interesting bits right now. Because when you start observing planet, you realize, oh, but maybe some element can be compared with other planet. So could you make a story 
about the origin of life. And then you have to open the chapter, which is the biology of life. It's called the prebiotic scenarios. And also, there's a lot of stuff in the literature. But since the last 10 years, there is a real revolution going on. Because now there is a very advanced experiment into that. Uh, they're not really reaching the stage when they're making life, but they're not that far. There is three scenarios that people are talking about. One of them, they're talking a lot, but doesn't mean very much, which is the hydrothermal vent story that it doesn't really work for plenty of reasons. I don't want to uh, talk too much. Essentially, the problem that we have here, it's a huge dilution problem. I mean, the ocean is going to dilute everything. And, uh, and today, if you go there, you don't see life being made. So uh, if it works, you should have work, and why doesn't it work? So, so there's a serious problem with this scenario. It doesn't have a really a complete scenarios. The interesting scenarios um, that were started by Miller, um, Miller and Yuri um, um, some time ago, I think is still an interesting avenue. The only thing that we know was completely wrong is the nature of the atmosphere. The assumptions they made is the atmosphere of the Earth was extremely energetic. If you are a chemist, you call that reduced. So it means there are energy, you can move the electron around. If you're not familiar with chemistry, it's simple. You just move the electron around. You can do that in three ways. You shake, you bring heat, or you beam with the UV radiations. That's the way to do that. Uh, or you have a catalytic mechanism that just make it like uh, explosions, for example. <laughs> that would just catalyze the reactions, the chemistry reactions. So, so the assumption they made is a very extreme energy, uh, extreme atmosphere. And we know it can only happen when you have a massive cometary impact. So possibly there are episodes where the, the amount of cometary impact was so huge that to create these conditions. The challenge here is the photometry um, is very unstable. So as soon as you create these molecules, they get destroyed. Automatically, they are reacting very fast. And then they're gone. And you cannot make life. So Titan um, has such a, such a chemistry right now. That's why people are a bit obsessed to go visiting Titan uh, in our solar system. And they should be obsessed. I think it's a great place to go, because that would be a way to test some of the scenarios on a real, not a planet in that case, but a huge satellite um, of, a, of a giant planet. Now, the most re realistic scenario right now that people are exploring quite intensively, it's called the HCN chemistry, cyanosulfidic chemistry. Um, HCN is, comes for free when you have a comet. So you have a lot of HCN falling on the, on the Earth. And that's a geochemical scenario. So it's going on on the surface of the planet with the mixing of water, river, flow, pound. And that's the reason why I think uh, people are going to Mars and trying to probe some area in Mars right now, because there's an expectation that some part of the scenario happened on Mars also in the past. And what is nice for an astrophysicist is there's a lot of predictions about the nature of the planet that needs to be done uh, to predict that. And there is a condition of the atmosphere. So it would be very nice to compare um, um, what you have practically into planet and how far you can reproduce this scenario. So this is kind of situation we are in. Now, we get a sense right now, so there's a different element that piecing together. And there is still another element that, that will come in astronomers will make progress. They are making progress in terms of the equipments into what you do see. The transit spectroscopy is very limited to transiting planets. So essentially, because of the likelihood of a transit, which is a few percent, most of the planet, they just, we don't, don't observe them, because we have no way to get the signal from the atmosphere. And maybe there is a very nearby planet. Um, one of them has been detected on Proxima Centauri. We would really love to just have a look what's going on. And we just don't want to stay for a couple of hours at the time of the transit. We want to stay there for weeks, maybe to look for seasonal effect, anything you can see going on on the planet. To do that, you need to make a picture. So this is the famous blue dot that you may have seen, and Carl Sagan uh, managing to convince the NASA probe to turn back and to pick a picture of the planet Earth to demonstrate that we lost in the, uh, in, um, in the universe in a way, and we should really take care of ourselves. Um, if you don't know the Cosmos story, you should really have a look at the, at the book. It's beautiful poetry. Um, and um, what happened here is the picture, I don't care. What I do care is, is this. I can get from that picture some information about the amount of light that is coming from that planet. If I would have an equipment to do that, this is what I would see. Very poor spectra, not great uh, uh, resolutions. I would see a lot of stuff. I would see water, CO2, I would see ozone, I would see all of that. And I can start making a story about that planet. If we do a picture, 
we can start doing that. And actually, we will do picture. The reason why? Because we're building the biggest telescope in the world right now. And that's for the next 20 years. But in 50 years, it will be an even bigger telescope. And even in space, maybe on the dark side of the moon, maybe on Mars in 100 years, I don't really know. But this is going on. The only challenge is to survive until there in terms of species. It's not really to build it, because you don't, you don't break the law of physics to do that. It's certainly something that can be done. And, and some of the nearby stars can be looked at with this, with this machinery. And we can do partially something like that. So what should be ready to look at? And that becomes the interesting bit. So to tell something that makes sense, we have to go back to the very few things we know. And the very few things we know very well where there is life is the Earth. So we can go back on the Earth and say, OK, let's assume that we have something like the Earth. So I have to also make, for those of you not familiar with the Earth science, what is the understanding in one, just one picture of the history of the Earth? Well, this is a very classical way for a scientist to show um, the history of the Earth. And it looks like a clock, essentially. So you start at the bottom. You don't start on the top. You start at the bottom. Uh, and you go around. So at the beginning, you just make the planet. It's the astrophysics part, which is key, because at that moment, they give you the, the key ingredients that you have on the planet, how the planet is being made. So understanding the planet gives you the starting point in a way. Well, it's not enough, because a lot of stuff you have at the beginning, like um, hydrogen and helium, you have because it's all around, and a lot of them is falling on the star later on. It's getting trapped by the star. Did you have some into the planet? It's very light, and it's going to get away, or it's going to get transformed and really push, put into the, uh, uh, into the rocks by mixing uh, with some elements. It will become a mineral in a way. Uh, but you have stuff falling also on, on the planet. A lot, actually. Because when you form a planet, there's all this outskirt of the, of the planetary system, um, which is essentially ice and water ice or CO2 ice falling on it. And this is great, because it brings a lot of carbon. So in a way, we're not lacking carbon, and we know that. And that's kind of a problem we have right now, because we're digging too much of the carbon back into the atmosphere. But the carbon is, comes for free. I mean, carbon will be in the planet. You will have a lot of CO2 in the planet, because this is what you get. And you point a radio telescope anywhere when you have formation of a system, you get CO2 everywhere. So, and water, by the way, as well. But they are falling on the planet. Of course, the way they fall is different. They're not falling the same way on Mars, on Venus, on Earth, and on Mercury. And they don't stay the same way because of the gravity. So there is already the story of the planet going on, and, and that is evolving with that. The heavy object, heavy stuff, is going to sink into the planet because the planet is, is kind of a molten at that moment. So that's why you end up at some point with the iron core uh, into the planet. And then the planet is cooling down gradually, and you end up with this kind of CO2, SO2 kind of planet. Water under, on the surface, it's not very sure. Maybe there is a bit of continent, not yet, but enough. And then something happened that we call the prebiotic moment. It's a big mystery when the chemistry of the surface is enabling life. Then after some time, quite long actually, two billion years after life, you see life in a blatant way because life has completely transformed the atmosphere and managed to trap the CO2 and to brought back oxygen, uh, replacing it. Um, I used to say at that moment that actually, if there are an alien civilization looking at us since a couple of billion years, they would say, oh, life is really doing a good job there. We're very visible. And people are afraid that we don't, don't shine too much that we're visible. No need to worry. We're visible since two billion years because of that event already. So it's no need to worry. If they want to come, they can come. Maybe they're already there. Uh, but certainly, it's not a worry to have, I think. Uh, and then we just change completely the planet. And we have oxygen, we have nitrogen, we have all this that is we know right now. And it changes the ball, and then we can study many, some other element of the detail. What I want to say about this is, in terms of astronomy, how does it look like? Because we never get that level of detail. It's pretty clear. But we can get the atmosphere. So what we do see on the right is simulation has been made uh, to prepare the next space missions. Uh, how it would look like depending on when you observe the planets, whether you have in a volcanic atmosphere, which we corresponds to the Archean Earth, whether you have, you come right after the beginning of the life, which is the Proterozoic Earth, or you come now. And, and you pretty see on the spectra you get, I mean, you don't need to be an Earth scientist. It's dramatically different. Everybody would recognize there is a massive difference. So the message here is, 
it doesn't take a lot of digit into your data to find out that something is going on on the planet. To find out what may be subject to long debates and a lot of questions. But detecting and trying to assess the kind of the nature of the planetology going on uh, should come very quickly if you get the right equipment. And you don't need a huge resolution here. So this is where we are actually right now. This is very close to happen. To help us, we're even bringing stuff from Mars and we're going to study this. And we will have maybe an understanding whether life started on Mars. Maybe there is some kind of uh, isotopic um, changes that you, know, that you expect only because of life that you're going to see on the rocks being brought back uh, from Mars. And it will be an interesting moment. Say, oh, OK, well, does it mean life from Earth went to Mars, Mars went to Earth, or they kind of uh, started in an independent way? Uh, and one day, maybe we go to Venus, and we look under the soil of Venus, where there's something that is left over over there. So this is a moment, but it's a fascinating challenge I mean, when you think about that, the complexity, because you can come up with a long list of data. And are we really ready for that? I mean, do we know what we're doing here? We kind of very excited because it's kind of a fascinating topic. But there's a long list of questions, and I'll just go through very quickly here. I think we don't really know what to look at. Well, atmosphere, of course, but then there is also what's going on under the surface, which is fascinating. So how far can we study the diversity of the solar system object? It's a couple of cometary objects. You've seen a couple of weeks ago, they got some piece of a comet back, and they are studying you know, the conditions of uh, uh, water, whether they find some, uh, uh, some amino acids already kind of developed there. Uh, what does it mean about market? How do you detect life, practically? Is it sure? Is it probability elements? Can we detect extinct life? Because it's very possible you start life many ways, and maybe we had life the first billion years on Venus and on Mars. It's gone. Can we see that we had life? Uh, and that's also something we're very interested about, because it's very likely to happen. It's very likely you start life, but you don't develop. And only very few happen, and then you dive away. It's possible. Can we make life in a lab, what we call laboratory life reverse engineering? And people are working very hard on that. And I do predict this will be a complete revolution in the next 50 years. I used to say we started the wrong way. We first managed to understand the power of destructions with the uh, uh, thermonuclear weapon. The next power we'll get, it will be the power of life creations. That is what these people are doing. And maybe in the future, we'll be able to uh, develop the consciousness exchange that maybe for another topic here, but that's just, just the tree power of God, I used to say, this usually. This is kind of a fascinating element here. So this is what is going on. So we need new equipment, we need a uh, new probe, and there's a lot, lot of buzzing around about that. But what we realize, and why I say we, it's not only me, with a couple of colleagues working on that since 10 years right now, it's not only about equipment, it's a change of mindset. Because it's pretty clear that if you want to say something meaningful into that, you have to understand a bit what the other are doing. When I say the other, it's not my dear colleague astrophysicist. It's my colleague's geophysicist, planetology, and even biochemist. I have to understand a little bit what's going on. I mean, how come can I design an equipment that's going to look for life on another planet? And we try to enable that. And that was a fascinating, difficult experiment, I must say, um, because I realized at that moment that everybody was kind of sitting on the desk and they were afraid of going away. For good reason, because as soon as you start asking for money, people are laughing right now. It is changing. They laugh way less right now because they realize what's going on there. And, and to do that, you have to bring all these different disciplines together. So I used to put that in this kind of trees here, and it's kind of a diagram. When you have the planetology, the chemistry, and the, um, and the, uh, and the, uh, and the astronomy going together. And there's a lot of loops and connections, depending when you see the evolution of life, the origin of life, and the impact of life. At the end, all these should go together to get something which is in the middle, which is giving you practically can we make life? Can we make life in a different way? And you can think about the consequences for, for life science when you start doing other life. I mean, now we're discussing about genetics and how we can play with the gene. Think about that we will be able to create life, another kind of life. Maybe that will be more adapted to the moon or to Mars. Or, and you can imagine this. It's just nothing prevents you to imagine, at least helping me here. How can we detect life? What is the impact of the life on the ecology of the planet? How does it play together? So we are experimenting right now in real time, the, 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 the time when the human is changing in a dramatic way the nature of the planet. Well, it started well, a thousand years ago, but I know it's very quick, uh, the way they're doing it. And also, how do you connect the planet with life? Um, we used to see a planet as a dead body, and life as something a bit special. 
Actually, it is not. I think the two are completely connected together. The planet is shaping life um, in a way that only one kind of life maybe is optimized for a planet and, and is pushed in the direction. Or maybe there is only one way to make life and you need a specific planet. We don't really know that. Once you have that, the life is going to, as a, as a feed loop mechanism, is going to change something on the planet. And the two obvious elements that is changing that we know is the oxygen and the carbon. All the carbon you made it have been through life. They are making by the life process. They optimize. This is what is being used to time old stuff that has been alive. Carbon-14 is using that technology, exactly this. And there's way more that you can do in terms of molecules, um, select selectivity that is being done by life, that promoting one molecule against another one. And it has a lot of consequences globally on the way all this ecology is working together. So I think it's a fascinating moment. And uh, a, a couple of us have decided to try to promote this and explain what you do. And we have, it has resonated in a different way. And I just want to end with, uh, with this slide. So we, we created an, uh, a kind of a changing of momentum, trying to get the jargon, be careful the way we're talking, trying to help the communications, trying to explain what is going on, and trying to fight the misconceptions. And we created these um, centers. Uh, and there will be way more. I actually know there is a dozen of them that's being created a bit everywhere. That exactly trying to do that. This is two that, that I'm uh, related to. But there is more. And what this center is trying to do is it's trying to help the people that want to work together. So we manage to bring the people together. <coughs> we give them a bit of seed money in a way they can start demonstrating that something is working to be able to just convince their colleagues and maybe funding agency this is a good topic. So I will leave you with these thoughts, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.